<laughs> hey friends, it's Chad, pastor of Founder. It's great to see you this morning. I'm here from my home office. I'm going to talk more about that in a little while though. Uh, but thank you so much for being part of worship today with the down line across our facility and a couple other things, the hurricane. Uh, we felt the best thing, the safest thing for us who was to worship virtually uh, from home right now. Uh, so a couple things I want to ask you to do. Number one, have you shared the stream yet? If you're part of Foundry, um, we would love for you just to share this on social media, wherever, however you're watching this right now. Just take the moment to share, invite your friends to be part of this with us. The second thing is, if you're new and you've never watched uh, uh, Foundry before, you never visited us in person, we would love to tell you thank you. Uh, digital connection card link should be popping up uh, right now as I'm speaking, and we would love to just get a chance to tell you thank you in a super fun way for being part of worship together. Uh, but then I said, I'm here in my home office. What's the deal? You know, we've all learned how to do different things from home over these last few months. Uh, this space to me, uh, it, it's, it's for many different things, but primarily this is where I encounter and I engage with God in personal ways and other ways. And even though we're watching from the house or from however uh, you're, where you're watching, you might be in the vehicle, you might be, um, I know it's fall break in Sterlington, you might be out with your family somewhere. Uh, we have the ability to invite God to inhabit this space. And there's things that we can do virtually that we can't do in person. So I want you want to ask you to do right now is to do just that. So if you would, do me a favor, grab the folks you're watching with. If it's your friends, if it's your roommates, if it's your family, whoever it is, just do me a favor, just, just huddle up real quick. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, pray and we're going to invoke the presence of Jesus Christ to be with us today as we worship and as we meet in different ways. This is uh, the space of the household. You know, uh, the household was the primary place that the early church was just transformed from. And so we're going to just kind of name this altar of the home today as we pray together to get things kicked off. And so Lord Jesus, we ask you be with us. Uh, God, we are here in these spaces right now, and we know that you are big enough uh, to be here with us, Lord. So send us and fill us with your power and with your spirit, Lord. Let us be with you in that way, God. Uh, let us be part of the, the changing of this world. And so, Lord, we consecrate this space together uh, to do those very things. So, Lord, we are here to meet with you. And we pray, amen. So we're about to uh, be part of some worship from a couple of Sundays back. Matt on the team uh, uh, led this. I'm going to share a message about what does it mean to understand the roles of reconciliation and harvest inside of movements of Jesus. And we're also going to hear a story from my friend Anna Gail Kane about why she decided to be part of our Even Greater Things campaign project and what we're calling uh, The Last Lap. And so thanks for being part of worship. We can't wait to just to do these things with you together today.
a Savior.
sunset that goes down yeah. over there oh yeah 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 um it's just i don't know i just everything's been going up so fast like it's just so like it's just so pretty and it's so bright in here and it's just i don't know like it's not like your typical church setting but it's like the foundry church setting i'm annie gail kane and i've been going to foundry for about three years and i serve in our children's and our student ministries from Monroe originally, and I currently live in the Sterlington area to get me closer to my teaching job at Beekman Charter School that's kind of in between Bastrop and Cross at Arkansas. What made me want to be part of the building project is I never, I guess I didn't really ever have the funding to be able to uh, give back to something like that I genuinely cared about. Like I was able to serve different things with my time like growing up, but I'd never been able to give financially. And so once I got into a place where I could give financially, I wanted to give to something that truly mattered to me and something that I could see grow and be a part of. This time I came to Foundry was probably about the last or probably the next to last time that Chad talked about um, the building fund because we were still in the Sterlington High School building and I wasn't coming regularly at the time and then once I started coming regularly, like Foundry just started meaning so much to me and meant so much to my life and um, just the just to be able to give back to something that means to you, even if like you weren't part of the initial process, it's just, it's just so, I don't know, it's like a warming feeling to know that you're having a part in something bigger than yourself. So what I want to just take you to space through this morning is to invite you to do uh, one or two things. Um, number one, if you uh, have not given to our campaign project, and if you were a person who pledged or a person who hasn't pledged, there's a way you can do that, and you can get our, our secure digital portfolio. Or also, if you're just a regular member of Foundry, I would encourage you to give. You support the ministries of this church in amazing, uh, life-changing, transforming ways. You hear me say so often that we get to say yes to so many things because you have said yes to Jesus through giving in a financial way through Foundry. And so we're about to take just a, a moment together where you can uh, give. Uh, the link's going to be in the description box below. They're also going to be in the chat bar, but also on the screen. So I invite you to just uh, come together with us and cooperate and participate in the mission of Jesus that's going on around us.
Over the last couple of weeks, we've been asking ourselves this question. What does it mean to be part of a movement of eternal consequence? And we've been going through portions of the book of Acts as we talk about this because Acts is the roadmap to the movement of Jesus. It's the, the story of the first movement of Jesus and how uh, it, it took this tiny group of people bundled together in this room, kind of huddled up and scared, and, and was able to just move across this world in the space of a generation and to begin changing everything. The first week we talked about uh, what patient and patient waiting looks like and the difference between the manifest presence of God and the omniscient presence of God. And put that in your pocket. We're going to come back to that later on today. But we also, the second week, we talked about, are you willing for your boundaries to be expanded? And we told the story of Pentecost and what that looked like. Uh, the next week, we jumped in the story of Ananias and Sapphira and also a man named Barnabas. And we talked about the trouble that graciousness can get us into. And last week, we began the story of Stephen and what the martyrdom of Stephen looked like uh, and how lesser is always better and bigger than greater. And so we're going to jump in today. We're going to pick back up in Acts chapter 8 with the story of this movement of Jesus. Uh, if you want to pop out your Bibles or you can read on the screen behind me or read on the screen in front of me. I'm, I'm so used to this in person. We're going to read the story of Acts uh, and the story of a man named Philip. We actually met him last week as part of these uh, these seven people that were in charge of a feeding ministry uh, inside the early church. This is what Acts chapter 8, verses 4 through 8 tells us. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Philip, for example, went to the city of Samaria and told the people there about the Messiah. And crowds eagerly listened to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. Many evil spirits were cast out screaming as they left their victims, and many who'd been paralyzed or lame were healed. And so there was a great joy in that city. Uh, I love this story, and it, it, it does so many cool things. Uh, but to kind of get us going, you know, last week we read the story about Stephen and these first men, and Philip is actually the second guy named on that list. And let's put ourselves in this story. We heard about Stephen. Uh, we, we, uh, about, we heard the amazing things he can do. And then we saw how he was killed for his faith. And then we hear about this scattering because of this persecution. And the next person we meet is this guy named Philip. And we might think, wow, okay, Chad, what's going to happen to this guy now? Like what really crummy story are you going to tell us at the end of the day? And we can relax. Uh, it's not. He was the second person on the list, uh, but nothing bad happens to Philip in our story today. Uh, but we, we can talk about what's going on, and really and true, what this is, is this is a story about reconciliation and harvest. It's a story about reconciliation in big ways, but also in little ways. Remember, last week we talked about how uh, the issue that got these seven guys together in this feeding ministry, where there were, there were, um, there were um, uh, Jewish Christians... And there were Hellenist Jews who had become Christians and just the awkward social situation that they had found themselves in at the time. Um, and, 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 and it's really two different groups of people who were constantly warring, thinking that they were better than each other. Uh, but the thing going on in that culture is um, what the one thing that all Jewish people could say, whether they were from Judea and lived there and spoke uh, Hebrew, or a Hebrew-speaking Christian, or whether they were a Hellenist, a Greek-speaking um, Jew, a Greek-speaking Christian. Remember, all the Christians right now are just Jewish. The one thing that they could band together and say was, at least I'm not a Samaritan. You know, think back to the story uh, in the Gospels of Jesus and the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan and that parable that Jesus said, uh, at least I'm not a Samaritan. And if we talk about Samaritans in Philip, this story, we find him in Samaria preaching to the Samaritans. Um, Samaritans in this culture, in this world, at best, they are tolerated. It's really what's going on. It's kind of the idea with the, with the Jews and the Samaritans because they were cousins of sorts, uh, of sorts. But it was really, it was, it was like saying, hey, listen, you just keep to yourself. We keep to ourselves. You stay on your side of the dividing line. We'll stay on our side of the dividing line. And we just won't mess with things. We're going to keep physical distance between each other. And that's why the story of Jesus and this woman at the well in John chapter 4 was just so transformative because Jesus sat next to 
to her and was like, hey, will you give me some water? He interacted with her. He treated her like a person. These are all these things that Jews and Samaritans just absolutely did not do with each other. If we go back in Acts chapter 1, though, when Jesus told the disciples, you're about to take my message to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And you've got to think, at that point in time, some of those people were probably groaning. They said, Samaria? we got to go to Samaria? You know, really? And here we see the Samaritan loop happening. Uh, because part of the necessary movement of revival um, is a flattening of assumptions about who belongs and who doesn't belong. You know, we talked about this a little bit last week of the problem of these widows not having their food and just some some subtle uh, frustration points uh, that Jew, that Hebrew speaking Jews had against uh, Greek speaking Jews and the cultural the cultural differentiation that's there. Um, but. Honestly, really and truly, if, if anything, the conflict of the first century church was a conflict about who is in and who is out. And for our story to be happening in Samaria today just completely magnifies that idea of who is in and who is out. But we also have to kind of get real and have to get honest with each other because of this. Because any conversation about Samaria and about Samaritans is a conversation about race. It's a conversation about belonging. It's a conversation, a conversation about worth. It's a conversation about purity. It's a conversation about who is in and who is out. And in 2020, if any follower of Jesus is praying for revival, is praying for awakening, is praying for a movement of eternal consequence, we have to understand that the, the Bible, that Scripture, that Jesus speaks about human beliefs on who is in and who is out. Because the first century Jewish disdain for the Samaritans was religiously justified. They thought they had the right to treat them like second-class citizens, to treat them like dirt, to treat them like people who have no worth. Like Go back and think of the story of the Good Samaritan, and you can see this worked out in the way these religious leaders would not touch this person who was unclean, but the Samaritan was willing to completely lay down aside everything to take care of someone who hated him. You know, Jesus breaking all of these rules in John 4, it showed that the gospel, uh, that it has a social dynamic, and the social dynamic of the gospel is supposed to be drastically different. Now, the healing presence of Jesus Christ, it changes our emotion, emotional and it changes our cultural dynamics. It flattens things out. It makes things equal. And so any tension that we as Christ followers have over issues of race, we need to have that honest conversation because what the gospel shows us is there is no room inside the movement of Jesus for racism. It's simply antithetical to the things and the words that Jesus says. And to just pop this into Samaria, like I said, any conversation in the New Testament that has Samaria or Samaritans in it is a conversation about race and about who is in and who is out. But like I said earlier, that the healing presence of Jesus Christ, it changes our emotional constructs. It changes our social constructs. It changes our cultural constructs. It, it flattens them out. It makes things equal. And we have to understand the role of reconciliation, of realizing there's, there's wrong, there's things that have been done here, and me as a follower of Jesus and us as the gathered people of Jesus, we have to reconcile ourselves to the fact that there is no space for in or out about belonging, not belonging, about worth, about not worth inside the kingdom of God. It's just, it's not there. And we see Philip here being sent out to this place in Samaria to do the things that nobody else they thought they could do. And this is why this matters so much in our own hearts and our own space. I'm going to read from the prophecy of Hosea. From chapter 10, some of you might know about Hosea, but Hosea was uh, an Old Testament prophet who was told by God to go and marry a temple prostitute of an idolatry worshiping system and that his relationship with her was to be a metaphor for the relationship between God and his people. It's a beautiful book, but I want to read just one verse from Hosea chapter 10 uh, to you. It's from verse 12. This is what it says. I say, plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest out a crop of love. So plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord, that He may come and shower righteousness upon you. 
It says to plow up the hard ground of the hearts. Now, this is what Philip is doing. This is what Philip is seeing. This is what Philip is experiencing. And this is just one of the amazing stories that's told to us about the power of the scattering. But ultimately, what's going on is they're breaking ground. You know, the Holy Spirit does that for us, but we also do that for the sake of the Holy Spirit. We've been having a lot of conversations about what does it mean for boundaries to expand. And if we are praying for God to redefine boundaries in our lives, we have to be willing to redefine the boundaries that we have put up for things. And we have to, to let the Holy Spirit come in and plow up the hard and broken places of our hearts in order for Him to come in to fertilize, to plant, to water, and for the harvest to spring up, not just out of our hearts, but in the world, in the community around us. You know, reconciliation by the power of the Holy Spirit is a dynamic about boundaries and it's a dynamic about inclusion. But here's the thing. And if you're uncomfortable with these conversations, if you're uncomfortable with this talk, if you're thinking, Chad, what's going on? Or you might be saying, hallelujah, praise Jesus. I love that we're talking about this. Regardless on which side of this you're falling on in our just divisive, cataclysmic, argumentative world right now in 2020, here's the thing. The way the Holy Spirit does this is very different from the way the world does this. The Holy Spirit does not do this in any way, shape, or form in the way that we as humans would seek to do this on our own. It happens differently. And Holy Spirit gospel reconciliation is a different thing that we are only capable of when we invite the Holy Spirit to come and break up this hard ground. It, it takes a different story. But the next part of this it jumps into is a conversation about harvesting. It's a conversation about the fact that all of these amazing things were happening here in Samaria. Samaria, these people who the Jewish, and their whole issue with the Samaritans was the fact that they felt that they were half-breed Jews who did not worship well, and that was the reason that they excluded them. So here you have Philip coming in here and preaching powerfully and boldly, and it says crowds are listening to him because they were eager to hear this message and to see the miraculous signs that he did. They were doing, dealing with this with their senses, with their eyes and their ears. Remember what scripture says, let us have ears to hear and eyes to see, like, this is happening right there among them. You know, once ground has been broken, the presence of the Spirit can move in and the occupation of the Spirit, we talked about the manifest presence of God, it is drastically different from what we can do on our own. And this is what we're finding here in this passage. You know, this is a unity it's about people being in older translations that says of one accord, of one purpose, of one mind. And they're, they're gathered around Philip because of the, he's teaching a gospel dynamic, a dynamic that is drastically different from the ones and the ways that the world will teach. And it broke through both supernatural boundaries and it broke through physical boundaries. And this actually looks like the teaching ministry of Jesus Christ right here. Like this story reads like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And here in Samaria, in the place that God's presence had left, it says in the Old Testament, God left, God abandoned this whole land. Here is Philip doing the things that no one thought could happen. And Philip brings in the full authority of Jesus Christ into this place. You know, uh, with uh, his, his calming over these evil spirits, he's showing supernatural authority, just like Jesus did. He's healing people of their sicknesses. He's showing physical authority, just like Jesus had. And we think about harvesting. You know, God's people are always sent out. And in the Old Testament, the Samaria, the whole northern kingdom, is a perfect example of this. You know, because of sin, they were cast out. They were sent out into exile. And those that were left um, were there, and they became the Samaritans. And the, the Assyrians moved in other nations, and they mixed and intermarriages, and different gods were brought in, and all sorts of stuff happened. But ultimately, because of sin, they were sent out. They're exiled, but because now in the New Testament, God is still sending his people out, but he's now sending them out in mission alongside of his spirit with the full authority and power of Jesus Christ and bringing that into the world. The scattered people of the persecution in Jerusalem, the scattered start spreading. And in 2020, in quarantine, in COVID, in Corona land, or whatever you want to call it, my new favorite C19er, 
we feel scattered, we feel discombobulated, we feel uh, worried, we are being sent. What is it right now as we worship together digitally, we have the ability to be sent out and to send out this message in ways that we're not going to anywhere close to possible six or eight months ago. God's people are always sent out, but in the New Testament we find that we are sent out with the power and the authority of Jesus Christ and sent out into His harvest. You know, this changes the way that we view how we are placed in the world. You know, we think about that dynamic of, of reconciliation, of harvest, and how it changes things. It also changes the way that we treat the places that we live. Now, are we willing to be part of the transforming of our communities by Jesus Christ? Or are we going to be the ones who avoid transformation and block a movement of the Spirit here? One of my favorite passages, Jeremiah 29, 7, it says, Pray for the peace and the prosperity of where I am sending you. And that's our call to be God's people. We're praying for these things to happen, and we're willing to work to do these things to happen, but they can't happen if we don't allow Jesus to transform us first. Will we let the power and authority of Jesus change the dynamic of how we see his purpose, of how we see his place, and of how we understand and call some people as belonging, but also as not belonging. And to, to close this out, just want to talk about the very last verse in this passage. And it says, and there was great joy in the city. You know, joy is a unique thing. You know, yes, it's about an experience of gladness, um, but it's also in scripture, this idea of joy is very specific. It isn't about happiness. It isn't about just when life is well. Joy is a very explicit idea, and joy comes because of two things. Number one, joy comes because someone is in the center of God's will, or joy comes because they're experiencing a movement of the Holy Spirit. Joy comes when there's the manifest presence of God. And here in this broken place where no one thought anyone could ever do anything, it is now being remade and remade because of the manifest presence of God in that space. Now, that should be a deep desire in our hearts. And we realize that in order uh, for us to get to that place, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to plow up that hard and that broken ground in our heart. For us to redefine our boundaries. For us to say, hey, God, if we want you to break boundaries and stretch boundaries for us, we are also willing to tear down the ones in our heart that are stopping you from coming in here in this space. So we're going to close out with this song that Madeline introduced me to a few weeks ago. Uh, this is actually from one of our Worship Wednesday streams. If you don't pop on, on Wednesdays on Facebook at 3.30, uh, Madeline and I, or Madeline and other people, or Madeline by herself, we have this time of worship, and it's kind of casual, it's just there. But she introduced me to this song a few weeks back. It's by a group that's called United Pursuit. It's a simple, simple song. It's called Garden, and it's all about remaking. So that's our prayer for today, is that for us to be remade, us to re be remade for a purpose of harvest, and for us to realize that if we want to see the harvest of God, but we are not willing for Him to remake us, that then we are going to, 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 we're going to be creating a boundary that stops God from moving in. So Holy Spirit, Father, wherever we are, whenever we're watching this, if it's uh, 1030 on the live or if it's throughout the week or if it's uh, two years from now, Lord, my prayer uh, right now in just many, many, many ways is God, is for you to break out the hard spaces of our heart, God. God, for us to see and experience you in new ways. God, teach us to be reconcilers so that we can be harvesters. Lord, thank you for your love. Amen.